one's not working? Check, check. Oh, okay. You wanna, we can pass it around. Yeah, I'll Here. say, let's hold the two mics between the three of us and see what that looks like. Yes. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, come on in, man. Oh, okay, here we go. Can you guys hear wait me minute, if wait I, wait I, Warren, you're, you're, can you hear me if, oh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me if my voice, if I'm this far away from the mic? All right. I'm How about this? This is just fine. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's good. Well, I was going to say, if instead of doing, well, I guess we can pass the mics back and forth, too. Will we pop our peas? So, uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is kind of a rare occasion because uh, when Qbert was created in 1982, or since, I should say, since Qbert was created in 1982, or sometime thereafter, uh, the three of us have not appeared at an event on a stage in front of a group of people like yourselves uh, ever. This yeah. is the first time that if, we've If the this was historic, it would be historic. We've actually been here, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I should also point out that the last time the three of us were physically together was two years ago in that hallway around the corner. Uh, by the strangest of coincidences, I, I was coming into Chicago, jump in any time, but yeah. I was coming in Chicago for something completely unrelated to pinball or video or anything. Right, and David, David told us he yeah. was gonna be here. So, yeah, so I wasn't gonna sneak into town, and so I told Jeff Lee, I'm coming into town, I'll be, you know, I'd like to see him. Warren's in LA, I didn't think I'd see him. And uh, I'm standing in the hallway, and I, I knew Jeff Lee was gonna show up, and I got a call on my cell phone from him. And then he shows up, and I, I nearly fell over, because <laughs> he was like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You belong in LA. So yeah, it was wild. Yeah, we, we, we had a very fine time. We basically ambushed him without him knowing that I was in town, and the three of us uh, were together. And that was uh, two years ago, here at this event, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't registered, yeah. but I was just <laughs> hanging out. <laughs> and, and with another one of our colleagues, uh, Jim Weiss, who yes. uh, was one of our hardware and software gurus yeah. at Godly. Yeah. And we have we have gotten together in pairs, uh, and we did one event uh, at the uh, was it the Midwest Gaming Classic where right up in Milwaukee. A couple Jeff years and ago. I were there, and Dave appeared on Skype on on a bed sheet. Yeah. <laughs> on a bed sheet, yeah. yeah. Dirt AV is top-notch. <laughs> that was in the bar. They, they've upgraded now. They've moved downtown, and it's, it's much uh, nicer okay. now. Yeah, so that was uh, – <laughs> that. anyway, but uh, let's talk about Qbert. Uh, this is going to be a fairly uh, loose, I think, and free-flowing conversation between the three of us. Uh, Dave does have a little presentation. I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, the stuff you're seeing. Uh, you know, normally when I give a Qbert talk, I have a whole prepared presentation – and uh, I, I talk a lot about all the slides you're seeing, but since the three of us are here and we're all gonna be talking probably at the same time, uh, just, it's just running on a cycle. Dave will go and do his presentation and then we're gonna plug in Jeff, oh, or maybe we can't. Well, we can't, oh, but I'll, damn, we, right. we'll, speaking of plugging, we will be plugging this recently published book. Yeah, speaking book. of plugging, Qbert uh, and we. We will give. Uh, uh, it's been long in the works and uh, I had it, I really pushed to have it ready for this event here. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I'll, I'll kick it off just by saying that it's just still mind blowing that people are interested in Qbert 30, <laughs> what, eight, thir no, wait, 35, 36, 36 years later. Uh, I started developing, I started the coding in 1982. The game was finished. We worked on it for through, through mo you know, mid-1982, mid, of mid and the game was probably finished in October, went out on test, uh, rolled off the assembly lines sometime in the fall. Uh, and started to really get out there in the world late 1982 and throughout 1983. And, and a lot, you'll see a lot of like magazines and uh, articles and uh, crazily things like USA Today is covering Kubrick. Glamour, Glamour magazine. There's, you'll see a little blurb from Glamour magazine. The New Yorker was talking about Kubrick. Um, it was uh, extraordinarily uh, popular uh, when it came out and uh, you know, we, I think we're all grateful for that. Yeah. <laughs> and really amazed that 30-some years later, people still, it was appearing in movies. Um, appearing in movies, although his nose is a little more yeah, flaccid right, than it used right. to be. <laughs> yes, yes. But yeah, that's astounding to us that uh, th old? there's like a new generation, mm. <laughs> you know, like ourselves, uh, <laughs> new, new generation <laughs> of kids. I remember 
last spring in Milwaukee, there was like a little cutest little five-year-old girl that was just going crazy because her dad wouldn't buy her more Qbert memorabilia, but she just loved Qbert from the movies, I guess, because yeah. I can't imagine she actually played the game much. Right. Uh, is, is there anybody here who, who has not heard the story of the creation of Qbert? Is anybody here who's not familiar with how Qbert was created? Because I feel like we've told this story a million times, but I'm happy to tell it again. I know Jeff, Jeff and I have, I think, slightly different we versions do, We of do, this. but... Uh, Maybe we should give equal time to yeah, each. Yeah, sure, sure. You want, you want to do yours first? I, I don't care. Well, okay. Um, I was always a fan of, well, since my college days, of M.C. Escher and, you know, his periodic cubes, which uh, he explored a lot. And uh, back in the 70s, I was fooling around with that, making a lot of drawings. And then a few years later, I come to work at this video venture. Um, and naturally, that started to show up in some ideas. And Khan Yabamoto, one of our programmers, saw, the, I guess I'd done some of this on the Apple. I don't really remember that so well, but that's what Khan's memory is. And so we quickly transferred that to the development system we used. Khan wanted to do something with that project, but he got sent off in another direction. Warren came along saw what was on the screen, and you should pick it up from there. Okay, so this is, the so basically what he said is absolutely true. What, what, what I saw on the screen was that Escher cube pattern, but it filled the screen from edge to edge. Um, and when I looked at it, of course, it was just fascinating because I also was fascinated with Escher. I had Esch Escher posters on my uh, dorm in college, you know. Uh, and the three dimension, uh, the three dimensionality of it, given that we had a very crude two dimensional system, really jumped out at me, and I thought that's really cool looking. Now, at the time, I was a new programmer. I had just started at Gottlieb in January of 1982, and the only thing I had done up to this time was I helped out on another game that Tom Malinowski was creating, uh, which went by many names. Many names. Uh, Protector. Argus. Guardian. Video Man. Video Man. Uh, why, why me? Why, uh, me? why me? Oh, yeah, that, that was how. Gentlemen the way, out there. Yeah. We have to interrupt and introduce who, somebody who really was a father figure and a mentor and the guy who created the Gottlieb de video department, Howie Rubin. Howie right Rubin. Right over here. So please, yeah. Yeah. Nothing we did would have happened without Howie Rubin and Ron Waxman, the vice president of engineering. Those two guys created the Gottlieb video department. Yes, it's true. Anyway, so... Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a green programmer, haven't done very much, and I'm walking by and I see this thing and, I, you know, I'm trying to find something to do because this uh, Pro Vidguard Argus, as I called it, uh, got scrapped. And basically they were like, all right, well, you, you know, you got your feet wet on this uh, game that didn't go anywhere. Now you got to do a game. That's what you're hired to make a video game. So please make us a video game. Um, Tim Skelly, who was also sort of our technical guru and mentor, was working on Reactor, and he was finishing that up. And I learned a lot from him. Uh, learned, uh, you know, how to do certain things, uh, techniques for doing certain things. Uh, but I wanted to program both gravity and randomness because when I looked at that screen filled with cubes, it occurred to me that if a ball fell from the top of the screen, landed on a cube, it would have one of two ways to bounce down, and. You know, I was a programmer. Programmers love binary. Zero, one, left, right, that's all you got. So, um, and, I, and, and it occurred to me if I carved that, that, those cubes into a pyramid, so every time when you landed, you, you always landed on the one particular cube, but then you had all these possible ways to go. You, the path could be determined by a single byte. A random byte of data would give you a path for a ball. So that's all I had. I was like, all right, I'm going to program a ball bouncing down this pyramid that I'm imagining, and I'm going to teach myself randomness and gravity. And I did that. That was, that was the first step. Um, then I needed, well, uh, you know, everybody would come by and they'd say, wow, this looks really cool. And I'd be like, okay, I just was playing around. And it's like, all right, well, I need a character now. I need somebody to control. And I went to Jeff. Jeff. Go ahead, you can take this if you well, want. Well, I had a, a game design but that I was working with, with like flatworms, another Escher concept, crawling on the cubes. And um, 
Then I designed a little document for a game we called Snots and Boogers, where this guy with a nose was shooting missiles at enemies that were on different dimensions on these cubes. And that's where the figure of Qbert first appeared on that document. So, uh, and my first, I never saw that document. I, I was not aware of this at all. I had no knowledge of this at all. Uh, when I went to Jeff and I asked him, I said, you know, I've got this thing and I, I need some characters to put on it. Do you have any characters? And I did. He threw all of these characters. He put like a line of characters up on the screen. I think all the characters from Qbert, maybe others, I don't remember. I have others too, yeah. 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 Never and, got uh, used. And, and I was like, that, yeah, the orange one with the big nose. Now the thing is, because I was a new programmer and I'm literally just trying to get my feet wet and learn stuff, you know, when Jeff floated this idea of him shooting out of his nose, I was like, no, because <laughs> it's too hard. I, was, I, want, I don't want hard, I want easy. I want something easy to program. So uh, I, I loved the character and I took the character, but uh, I, I nixed the idea of shooting because I, I couldn't figure out how to make it easily work with the directions of the pyramid. You know, it just didn't, you know, where is he shooting? How are you aiming? It, it was all too complicated for me. Uh, but Jeff went ahead and he expanded the angles of the character. He gave me all the angles I needed and I implemented him jumping around the cubes. And then that's all I had. So people were like, okay, this is pretty cool. Of course, a lot of people didn't like the fact that you could jump off the pyramid and die. A lot all of people right. gave me flack about that. But I was like, no, it's gotta be some challenge to it. You gotta feel some accomplishment. So I kept it in and, um, and then. And that's with the uh, diagonal joystick too. The, uh, yeah, diagonal. people gave me flack about the diagonal joystick and I thought, well, but how else would you have, I mean, how <laughs> he's not going up and down. Every time Kubert moves, he moves yeah. at a diagonal. So yeah, to me, plus. it only made perfect sense. So, so I never understood that criticism. And I stuck to my guns on that one. Um, anyway, so I, I also implemented collision detection, which was a little tough for me because the balls are bouncing and there's this implication of a third dimension. Um, but the idea, you know, I have Qbert running around and he's avoiding the balls. And uh, now Ron Waxman, real character, uh, I mean, very large man, smoke, always smoked a cigar, would occasionally come in to the room where us programmers work. We were all in kind of one big like think tank area. Late at night. <laughs> Late at night. Yeah. yeah. He only wanted to talk to the worthy people who were staying past five. Yeah, he'd be in his office most of the time. At night, he'd come back to our area. And I remember one night, I'm sitting at our development system, which was this blue box, it was the Intel blue box. It was a blue box. It was large. Uh, and he's sitting behind me, and he literally sounds like Darth Vader. You know, it's like, I can hear him breathing. You know, it's like... <laughs> I'm hearing this right behind me as I work. So I've gotten kind of gotten used to tuning it out. Uh, but he's there and I'm working. I'm just kind of playing the game, trying to figure out what to do. And then I hear his voice behind me going, uh, what if all the cubes change color when he lands on them? And I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. So I, I, I took that idea and I ran with it. And to me, that's kind of when the, it became a game. I, I, how you, you'll tell us when it was on the schedule. I don't remember when it got put on the schedule officially, but to me, that's when it sort of became a game. Before that, I was just kind of messing around. Um, and then after that, I don't know if you guys want to add anything about the, the actual development of it, because to me, it just all, it was just one thing at a time. Well, Peop we did. Um, Originally, I had these enemies coming in at different angles. And so you added them at some point and that gave you a little difficulty? I yeah, think? that I remember <laughs> Jeff goes, wow, what if we have enemies coming in at these at the other angles of the pyramid, you know? And I was like, oh, Jeff, you're killing me, damn it, you know? Because I'm trying to keep the game simple for me. Uh, now you had gravity going different ways. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know, you know, because obviously we're working under extremely, you know, limited memory, limited speed. We had no trigonometric functions. Uh, but I, 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 this idea actually stuck in my brain and I couldn't get rid of it. And I eventually was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to tackle it. And then, and then I did. Um, but all the elements to me just sort of came, came together. They were fairly obvious. Well, we need a guy to chase after you know, uh, the, the player, we need uh, an escape to the discs. 
Um, and then just, you know, the, the, the cartoon balloon, um, which I, I, I think, Jeff, was your idea, the cartoon balloon. Uh, yeah, I've got uh, sketches of that. It's, it goes back to, like, high school or earlier. It's, it's an old comic book device. Well, yeah, know? right. So I think we're all it, familiar it just, with it. But if and it at one point, uh, when it, a lot of you may know, it went out on test, and there were actually marquees printed up with that uh, square balloon. Yeah, well, that's uh, a, and then that's a whole other story, which is how Kubert got his name. Because uh, all throughout the development of the game, I had no name for it. I had, I literally, I, I was like, I just am trying to put a game together. I don't know what I'm doing. But, uh, you know, we, we had to name it when it was done, when we were about to put it on test. So I think everybody kind of agreed that the name of the character should be the name of the game. Well, what are you going to name the character? So I went around and polled everybody. I actually wrote down names on a list, uh, you know, a piece of legal paper. Every, I just polled everybody in the company. I, I don't know if you guys remember this or if you guys remember the names. I, the only name I remember was Arnie Aardvark, and that was Frank Starshack who came up with Arnie Aardvark. And, and I was like, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, recall a meeting, I don't recall a meeting where we went in. Here's bring names in this meeting. We're sitting around spitballing, and people had lists. Uh, well, that was ultimately, that's what we did. Because the name, you know, getting suggestions from the people that worked there didn't seem to work out. So we did have a meeting. Uh, you were not there, Dave, but you were there. Yeah. And Rich Tracy was there. Howie was there. Ron was there. Bill Jacobs was probably there. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe 10 people sitting in a conference room uh, trying to come up with a name for this little orange guy with a big nose. And it, I remember at one point, stepping out of my body and thinking, this is absolutely surreal. What are we doing? I mean, I was, I was in my mid-20s, but I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> is that what you went to school for? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, but then somebody wrote the name Hubert up on the whiteboard. Oh, Rich Tracy. Rich Tracy came up with Hubert. He was our art director, my and, boss. And, and we were like, okay, uh, Hubert, okay, well, why? He's like, I don't know, it's a cute name. But then somebody made the connection and they changed the H to a C because it's cubes. So they saw Hubert and they were inspired. And then, listen, we were there for probably two hours at that point and I'm, everybody's getting antsy. But now you can feel this energy in the room and people are like, oh, Hubert, oh, something's clicking here. And then somebody walked up and maybe it was you, Jeff. No, no, you came in later. Somebody took the CU and erased it and put a Q. And everybody's like, wait a minute, we're on to something. But there was Q dash, and Jeff changed the dash to an asterisk, and it became Qbert. And we all jumped up, and we screamed, and we were hugging each other. No, we, that didn't happen, but, uh, but it felt that way in my mind. That <laughs> never happened at Gottlieb. <laughs> anyway, so that's how Qbert got his name. But then Howie was like, no, 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 we're going to put it out with the cartoon balloon. That's going to be the name. And we would say, that's Howie, you're insane. How, how are people going to refer to it? How are people going to order it? And Howie said, and I'll never forget this, he said, they'll find a way. If the game is good enough, they'll find a way. And I got to say, I, I, I appreciate and admire that logic. Howie is definitely an out-of-the-box thinker. <laughs> Howie used to, I'll tell you another Howie story. So when I first started, we were in Bensonville. We were in a big plant in Bensonville, nothing rolling off the line. We had a big empty plant, just the new video department, which was very small. I don't remember how many people, maybe a dozen people worked there. And in the middle of the day, we'd all be working. We'd all be working hard and, and enjoying working. And Howie would run and go, everybody stop working. We're going to go out in the plant and play some football. And he made us stop working and go play football. But it was the right thing to do. I mean, it was good for us. I thought, do you remember this? Am I uh, I'm not a football player. Mm. I, right. would, I would have gone off the loading dock and just fell sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe this is a good transition for how he got his voice. Yeah. I think it's a great our, transition. Yeah, he had a name. He, he also had a voice. A AV, we need to switch. From, maybe we can do it. We're, we're technical. Yes, absolutely.
Well, I don't know about the word fancy. I, I really wanted it to feel fair because it, it is completely uh, a kludge. You know, there, the, we had no depth in our, um, in our system. It was just a flat system of sprites. And so I had to basically, you know, based on which direction each object was going, I had to see what their overlap was and then decide if I wanted to call that a collision or not. And it was tricky, but uh, it got to the point where I felt it was fair, and when people were playing it, most of the time, nobody said, oh, that's not fair, I shouldn't have collided. Once in a while, but um, it's, it's just so muddy when you, you know, because, because it's an isometric game, it's, there's not actual uh, third dimension. So let's see if we get sound here. I can make Hubert sounds if you want. No, no, no. I can make Hubert sounds too. Okay, the sport I do remember was uh, softball. And uh, our engineering department had a team, and there was a factory team. And I guess we were in league with other companies. And I think we lost every game we played. Was, uh, I'm one of the worst baseball players ever. Um, you might have been the star of the team. Or, uh, oh, I don't know about that. No? I played softball. I'll just keep doing yeah. it until you get it out of the speaker. Oh. Oh, okay. That's why I always have sound on my first slide. Is that the Titan Eagle? No, see, it's coming out of there. No, the video is still connected. HDMI is still. Hang on, just just Skype me too, so maybe you'll find it. That doesn't make any sense. Nope, couldn't find it. Wow, we are technically challenged here in 2018. Well, I'm still extended, so it should be up there. You guys made it go. You guys made it go away. I'm so sad. Any other questions while we're waiting? Anybody have any questions? Keep doing until we get the random. That was Jun Yum, hardware designer. Um, I mean, I, from Midway. Yeah, uh, Midway alumnus. Uh, native of Korea. Uh, he went through several iterations of the board, right? It thinks um, it's uh, coming. It's being extended. Yeah, and um, he later went on extended. Oh, yeah, it was. to design it was some boards for some games we worked on for Premiere, mm -hmm. um, Exterminator game, and um, that was his thing. Um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, right, it was on a dip switch, so you could, a lot of people had the knockers turned off just because they found them annoying. Uh, but Jun didn't really have anything to do with the knocker. Uh, the knocker was the idea of one of our engineering techs named Rick Tai. He's the one who originally had the idea. And, and since we've got the question, I'll just finish the story. So uh, Rick uh, had this idea for the knocker, and when we put it in, it, you know, it sounded like a knock. It sounded like the knock you know. And I did not know that, I did not like that. I did not want that because it sounded like a knock, like somebody knocking at the door. What I wanted, I wanted was a thud, like a body hitting the bottom of the cabinet. So here's what we did. We put a little piece of foam right where the knocker hits the cabinet and it made the perfect sound. It, it sounded like a thud and I was so ecstatic. And when we went to management and Howie, I don't know if you remember any of this, but we went to management they said, no, we can't put the foam in 
because it's like an extra $15 yeah. per cabinet of labor. And so the foam didn't go in, the knocker went out, and I was unhappy with it, but everybody seems to love that feature, so I'm not going to complain. But I will say that if you own a Cubert cabinet, try putting a little piece of foam in there and see what it does. Because it. You realize Warren's vision. Try that, but don't hurt yourself. Not if you do it yourself. I guess you got to find the right foam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so, but I'm just, I mean, there's no. I'm just running through here. Yeah, so you can just drive through here. Right. Is it really a PC? It does not. Was it the second screen on this? Okay, we'll just do that. I'll just, I'll just, yeah, I can, I can do that. Also made it much easier for um, emulators uh, in the future. So many Gottlieb games can be emulated with the same emulator. Okay, we have it. We have it. See, video is easy, audio is hard. It always is. I, I, it's two signals. I don't get it. Okay. So I have I have a tight little seven-minute presentation. I'll whip through it. See, I've done these before. You always want to slide with some sound. Now I know the presentation works. Time machine. So I've started my career. Uh, I've done a few pinball machines. I did these uh, at Data East. And I got a Qbert's Quest. I didn't know I did it because I left the company. Uh, I left the company in like 83. I saw the writing on the wall and I went off into home game consoles for Nintendo and, and stuff like that. And uh, then they sold the assets and they became Premier and they did all this stuff. Um, four years ago I gave a presentation in Las Vegas and when in Vegas you go to the museum and I went to the museum and they had a Cupid's Quest. That's novel and I played it and I was like, those are all my sounds, thank you. <laughs> Pretty much, I mean, the great Craig Byerwaltus, who did all the coin-op sounds for pinball, had added a little connective tissue, but it was only about 20%. The rest of it was mine, so I put it on my CV now because it's all Qbert sounds. Whoa, way too much of that. Way too much, whoa, <coughs> way too much of that. But, so I, that was the first pinball game I worked on, and I didn't know I worked on it. Then I oh I didn't get paid for it no work for hire that's a that's a theme which will run through the Cubert notion here <laughs> work for hire you know you create this is my baby thank you we own it okay uh, and I've done a few pinball machines but let's get back to the Cubert story now I don't have my notes anymore so the back story is how did I even get to do this how does a how does a guy from Indiana end up doing this crazy thing. In 1980, I was working in data services at an insurance company. A headhunter found out that I was an avid microcomputer hobbyist and got me an interview with the brand new video game division at Gottlieb. I was interviewed by Ron Waxman and he was very frank. Why should we hire you? You're from an insurance company. I convinced him to let me have a week. I went home and created a simple space game. It had a shooter and it had bullets that went across the screen. I don't think I had hit detection yet, but it looked like a game. 
I got the job and I gave a two week notice at my company. During that two weeks, people worked on me, told me what a crazy thing this was to do. But I started to waver. Oh, yeah, all right. On Friday, which should have been my last day, I called Ron and said, well, I've thought it over and I don't think I'm going to take the job. Ron said a couple things to me and then he basically just said in his way, see you on Monday. And I showed up at Gottlieb. So Ron, in my career, is a very key person. That is an exact true story. I was not going to leave the comforting womb of my bogus insurance company and go off to Bensonville to this empty factory. And, and I wasn't even that nuts about video games. I just wanted to stop working on mainframes and work with 8-bit processors and get somebody to pay me to do that. But uh, I'm so glad Ron was Ron. Because, like, ah, see you Monday. Uh, and this is a revised Qbert story, because I've told this story many times, particularly about how the voice came about. And I've much maligned a piece of technology that it's not really quite fair. A little more context. OK, now I'm working at Gottlieb, but I'm not doing sound yet. Nobody needs any sound. They're still trying to make graphics boards and stuff. So I was making graphics utilities on the Apple II for sprites, which I think you may have used. Yeah, yeah, so it was really, if you didn't have that utility, then you were like drawing it on graph paper and you know, with like hex bytes and stuff. So I made a utility on the Apple II to do that. I became the sound programmer because when Tim Skelly's first game, which hadn't even been named yet, was starting to become mature, Tim knew it needed audio. I'd been talking to Tim, I respected him. He's the only one there who had ever had games produced. He had been very successful at Cinematronics. I had been a musician since high school. I'd played for seven years full time in rock bands, and lounge bands. And when they said, gee, we needed sounds for this game, I raised my hand and said, hey, I'm your guy. So now I'm the sound guy. And from the North Lake plant, they brought over an, an instance of the Gottlieb soundboard and a little bit of code that Craig Beyerwaldus had done so I could see where the addresses were and stuff, and said, hit it, kid. Now, you need to understand a little bit something about the Gottlieb soundboard. Back in the day, this was harder than it should have been. Oh. Programming was hard and only for men. The reason was, is I, they, they gave me this to do the job on, the Rockwell Blue Box. And, and like the Intel Blue Box, it was a ICE. It was an in-circuit emulator. So out of that box, well, OK, out of order. Uh, out of that box came a, a thing you plugged in to the host, and you literally emulated the 6502. But the problem with the Rockwell was, it wasn't really for software development. It had 16K of memory total, which enforced certain kinds of disciplines on your coding, like you didn't have enough memory for a symbol table and to run the code and to run the assembler and lo loader linker and the emulator. So you couldn't really have uh, label names or any kind of names bigger than three characters, four at the max. This makes it harder. And that's a little, if you can read it, this is an example. I mean, assembler's gobbledygook anyhow. And then when your labels have to be L1, L2, it's bad. Now, the other part about this box, which was so interesting, was that you extended the processor out of the box onto the target. And the target was like attached to, the, to a pinball, uh, I'm sorry, a coin-operated video game cabinet next to me. And the back was on it. And to make this work, you had, the, the box had to get its power to run the thing from the host. If that was ever interrupted while you were doing this, it reacted by turning on that disk drive right over the, the, the directory and wiping out your disk. Now, I'm over here coding and doing something Somebody comes by over here and bumps my cabinet and the door opens and there's a power interlock because there's a high voltage coil on the back of a monitor that you don't want anybody to get hurt by. 
that effectively cuts the power to the processor, which the box responds by wiping out your source. It was a lot harder than it should have been. I just thought this crowd would appreciate a war story. Now, eventually, Jim Weiss, who was mentioned, built me a ROM emulator board that fit in an Apple II. So I could emulate the soundboard's ROM with that. And it looked just like ROM to the game system, but it was inside the Apple's address space. So I could even tweak the code while it was running, as long as I stayed away from code. I could tweak variables and stuff. That was cool, and I had 48K of RAM. Now we're talking. You know, I, w I was gonna get an aid. I was gonna go to a, a drugstore and buy one of those cards, those happy birthday cards. When you open them up, they you know, play music for about two minutes. Those cards have so much more memory <laughs> than, what, than what I devoted my life to for two years. So don't touch that door. <laughs> That was, I had a big sign eventually put on the back of my coin-op cabinet until I got rid of the blue box because horrible things would happen. The Gottlieb soundboard. The Gottlieb soundboard used a microprocessor to create a stream of numbers that were converted into voltages, amplified, and sent to a speaker. Jim Weiss designed the board. It was first used in the pinball machine Mars God of War. There were not a lot of resources. 4K of EEPROM, a 6502 running at a little less than 1 MHz, 128 bytes of RAM, an 8-bit digital-to-analog converter, and from the Federal Screw Works, really, the SC01 Fultrax. Yes, that's important. Now, Qbert sound starts, doesn't start with Qbert. So that's Tim Skelly's first game, and management knew that we had a talking soundboard because the board talked for Mars badly, but it talked. So they insisted they wanted their video game to talk as well. I'm a junior sound guy, sure, whatever. So they gave me this. I mean, they gave me the soundboard, it had that part on it, and then I could go to the data sheet and try to figure out how one goes about using this. And yes, I think there is no small irony that this part comes from the federal screw works. Because that is the way you feel after having used it. That's my primary tool. Those are the 64 phonemes that the chip synthesizes. I mean, in this time, that's pretty cool that it even did this, right? But it's like the dancing bear. It dances, but it doesn't dance very well. So, and of course, expressed in hex, you want to make the S sound, you put in one F. Of course, why not? So the only tool that I had to make this damn thing talk was the dictionary. So if I wanted it to say something, I would go to the dictionary and see how the dictionary thinks phonemes were expressed. And then I would try to find the magical mapping between that and these. And uh, it wasn't fun. But it particularly wasn't fun for Reactor because we had a little chamber, a little bonus chamber where the, a character could get knocked in there and every time it hit the wall, you got some points. And when you cross thresholds, we wanted to say 1,000 bonus points because it's an eye busy task. Your character's actually over here, the thing's down here bouncing around the bonus chamber. 2,000 bonus points, you know, 3,000 bonus points. That's how they wanted it to say it. Of course, we had the Voltrex chip. It wasn't going to do it. So I set out to do that. But the problem was bonus points. Seems simple enough. I tried the obvious mapping from the dictionary to the thing. Didn't work very well. And then I tried some other stuff. When that didn't work very well, then you just start trying crazy stuff. And the thing is, after an afternoon of doing this, you, there's a, a, a psychological phenomenon called habituation where after you've been trying to do a thing enough, you think you've done it. So then some poor innocent would walk through the lab and I'd grab him. I'd say, come over here. And then I'd play 10,000 da-da-da-da. 
every freaking time. What are bogus points? I could not, I tried Z's, I tried H's, I tried everything. I could not get it to say bonus points. Now, I'm a grown man, and I've been doing this for days, and out of frustration, I was talking to uh, Chris Brewer, who was my hardware tech, and we just sort of said, hell with it. What if you just put random numbers into the chip? What does that sound like? It sounds like that. Bam! That's cool! Meanwhile, Hubert doesn't exist yet. <laughs> just random numbers. I mean, see, it's like in modern art, you know, back in the day when you pa painted a portrait, it took a lot days and days making a beautiful rendering. In modern times, we just have conceptual art where you come up with the idea, hey, let's cover the South uh, San Fernando Hills with a big orange tarp, you know? It's just the concept. And so sticking random numbers in the chip is pretty much the same thing. 10,000 bonus points. Damn. Well, that, you know, it's not, it's the Voltrex quality, right? But. 10,000 bonus points. <laughs> Bastard. Okay, it, it, I think the website's down now, but there was a website you could go and you could put in a phrase and then this guy would put it through whatever system he had and feed it to a real Votrax chip, digitize that, and make the wave file available to you. And that's what that is. I am humbled. It actually is possible, however badly, for the Votrax to say, 10,000 bonus points. Bastard. But if I had been able to do it, I may have never stumbled into Qbert territory. So, Qbert sound fact number two there is no swearing coded into Qbert. <laughs> Virtually all of the Qbert speech is the result of sticking a series of random numbers into the Votrax chip. <laughs> with two exceptions. Hello, I'm turned on. And. Bye bye. See, that's important. People ask about that. And people asked at the time. They, we got letters. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got letters. Parents complained. People would literally, people would think that uh, Hubert was swearing. People would say, they swear to me, I heard him say blah, yeah. blah, blah. Pe people, I th think some people, in Ar uh, a kid in Arkansas wrote up that his parents banned him from playing the game uh, because of the swearing. See. I know it's an infinite. He has a number, an infinite number of phrases because it's just a random number generator, and you know, I feed ten of them in, and so I'd love to take it to court, put the game in the thing, and just let it talk all day. The problem, the problem is you can't prove he didn't say that. Well, the one thing was we used to have one in the cafeteria where we where we ate, and it made sound during the track mode, and I'll swear to God it said Radio Shack one day. Seriously. Sound fact number three. Kubert's pyramid completion tune had been written years before by me as a jingle and submitted to a local car dealership. You get a lot of great car when you buy one from us for the best deal on a new or used car. They didn't buy it, so it ended up in Kubert. That's it. Bye-bye. I'm done. Thank you, David. So the key fact of that was I had that voice in my pocket. I was just, you know, wow, this is cool. Then I go down in the lab where I think Warren had just put the, the orange thing on the pyramid and was like moving it around. I don't know if you remember, but I came up to you and said, you don't know me, but I have something for you, yeah. and you're going to like it. Yeah. So I realized that uh, this uh, slide was uh, kind of stuck up on there, uh, and, and the reason was uh, it needs me to push a button. But while it's stuck there, I thought I'd tell the story because um, Kubert was featured in this uh, issue of Video Games Magazine. It's from April 1983. And um, I remember when this guy, Neil Tesser, came to interview us, and he interviewed the three of us as a group. And uh, Gottlieb did not permit our names to be used in the article. 
And the interesting thing is that the, the, the thrust of the article is that Qbert and Joust, which came out about the same time, were both really successful games made in America because most of the popular games were made in Japan. So Qbert, Joust, the timing was right. The article covers both Qbert and Joust. In the Joust section, everyone's name is in the article. I mean, uh, John Newcomer, Eugene Jarvis, Ken Fidesz, ev everybody in Williams is named, that had to do with Joust, is named in that article. But in when they talk about Gottlieb, Gottlieb wouldn't let us use our, our name, so I was designer. That was, that was my code name in the article. Jeff was artiste, <laughs> and Dave was Jay, Jay Walkman. <laughs> you know, the weird thing is, uh, when we worked on the caveman game, which was the first game I worked on the previous year, uh, in Play Meter Magazine, there was an article, the Gottlieb's uh, Pinball Evolution. It, it was a hybrid game. And uh, they named us all in the article. Um, so it wasn't like it was a secret. They, they named everyone, except they didn't give the actual programmer, Joel Krieger, credit. He wasn't mentioned at all, they said Frank Frank Starshag had programmed again. Yeah, they tended to get things wrong. Uh, I, I have one of these pictures that are cycling through is a picture from uh, Play Meter uh, or Replay. I can't remember which one, but it had uh, me and Howie, uh, Jun Yum, the hardware designer, and Boyd Brown, who was the president of the company. And um, so uh, it says that it, it says that you know something about Qbert, and then the designer Jun Yum, so implying he was the designer of the game, but he was not. And then it said programmers Howie Rubin and Warren Davis. So they, they tended to get things wrong a lot. Howie wore so many hats there. Yeah. Uh, and then another thing you s I think you just saw in a previous slide, uh, after that article, you saw there was a sort of a, a credits page. But that was from Faster, Harder, More Challenging Cubert. So the upshot of this magazine article was that, you know, when we saw that Williams people were named in that article and we were not, we really kind of were pissed. And, and uh, we convinced management to let us, when we did faster, harder, more challenging, Hubert, I put in a credit screen. So, for really? yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Your name's in there. Yeah. And <laughs> and one programmer, Khan Yabamoto, who did Mad Planets, snuck around that. He had Khan in, in the high score table. He's got Khan going across, and then he has Yabamoto <laughs> as the first letter of each right. name going down. Right. So. Uh, yeah. He managed to give himself some credit. That was cool. Um, there's another story I like to tell, and that's uh, about when we were merged with the main plant. So in the middle of the development of Qbert, we started Qbert in Bensonville when we were separated from the main plant of Gottlieb, which was located in North Lake. But at some time during the development of Qbert in the summer of 1982, management moved us, and again, Howie, this is a great place where you could jump in if you want, but management moved us from Bensonville into North Lake. And we were, you know, I, I mean, I, I thought that was kind of cool because I was excited about meeting all the pinball designers. I, I loved pinball, and I admired all the guys who made pinball machines, but I, you know, had never met them. And so we come in to the main plant, into new offices, and, and we, you know, all of us, I think, were kind of excited and, and wanted to meet these guys, and they're giving us the stink eye. They are looking at us like, you little minion. And, and we didn't understand why. And then we, uh, we came to realize that they were never allowed to develop video games. They wanted to, they were the one to be the ones to jump in the video market and they were not permitted. You want to answer? Well, it was a little different for me being an uh, artist. I knew the artists who did, you know, the pinball art, the cabinets, the back screen. So I was put in that department with those guys and some of them were friends of mine. So mm -hmm. it was awesome from my end. Sorry yeah. about that. Well, the other thing it was, they built a space out for us. We all got the new offices. That's right. They were kind. I think they were kind of shoved in the back yeah. at that point. So right. they were not happy, and uh, I understand why. Uh, the other thing is, at some point, because Coca-Cola was our corporate overlord, we were actually owned by Columbia Pictures, and at some point, Coca-Cola bought Columbia Pictures, and I don't know how what was happening up in upper levels of management, and that's one of the things Howie and Ron were really good about is sort of protecting us from upper management. But uh, they called us into a meeting once and announced that we were going to change our name. 
Gottlieb, which, listen, Gottlieb is a family name, and it's a historical name, and I don't know why they felt the need to change it, but they felt the need to change it, and they unveiled it in this big logo that they probably paid, you know, $50,000 to some company to develop, and it says, we're now going to be called <laughs> Milestar. And then I, my, my first thought is, and I said this out loud, does anybody realize that's rat slime spelled backwards? And yeah, 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 and and I gotta say, Boyd Brown did, was not happy. Everybody laughed, but he did not. He and did I, not find that I amusing. Might point out that that is the uh, <laughs> I, I've expropriated the Rat Slime name of this, of this publishing company. That's right. So, uh, so it lives on. True. Well, awesome they work. didn't realize too. They were going home at five, and we would be there till eight or nine or ten or even later sometimes, yeah. just because. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, but no, we, we, we put in crazy hours. We were like insanely motivated at the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's. Uh, d does anybody have any questions? Uh, I don't exactly remember. I just heard about this movie, and um, someone said Kubert's going to be in it. Um, and when I saw it, I loved it. I thought uh, I thought they did a real credible job. Um, <laughs> you know, in a way, Kubert's been abandoned by Sony um, or Columbia Pictures, whoever owns it, and uh, that was reflected in the movie. I thought that <laughs> was a, a real nice touch. Well. I saw the trailer for Wreck-It Ralph, and oh look, Cubert! I think my wife pointed it out. Wait, isn't that Cubert? First time I saw it was somebody. Somebody told me. I, I heard about it before I saw anything, and then I saw the trailer, uh, and I was sort of excited about that. I thought because um, Cubert has been somewhat abandoned in recent years, and I thought, oh, maybe they're going to do something with the character. You know, none of us own the rights to Cubert in any way. Uh, we were work for hire. We signed something when we started at Gottlieb that said anything we develop for the company belongs to the company. When Gottlieb folded, that reverted to Columbia Pictures. Uh, although there was, didn't the JBW try to buy right. the rights? Uh, Ron, and uh, uh, Ron and a couple other guys, uh, other executives started a company. Uh, they, they took the laser di disc technology and did some work for the U.S. Navy. Um, and somehow they were the licensor for... Hubert, and I presume the other games, but Hubert's the only thing they ever did. There was a number of cartridges. Um. And then at, s at some point, the rights reverted back to Columbia Pictures, which was bought by Sony. So Sony owns the rights. I in the mid-1990s, I was at a game developers conference up in uh, uh, you know, San Jose. And uh, I remember there was a Sony booth there, Sony's game division, and I went up to some guys that were working there, and I said, do you why don't you guys do anything with, with uh, Qbert? And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you own the rights to Qbert. And he said, we do? And he was like scrambling around telling all this, and did you know we own the rights to Qbert? We own the rights to Qbert. So a year later, there was a version of Qbert for the PC. So I credit myself with telling Sony that they own the rights to Qbert. 
However, uh, when Wreck-It Ralph came out, they really haven't done much with the character over the years. And so um, I, I was sad that he was realistically portrayed <laughs> as, as being forgotten. Because, you know, I felt, but I was happy to see him. And any time you put Kubrick in a movie or out in front of the public, I, I, I'm thrilled. I, you know, I think all of us take great pride and ownership. And uh, we're just grateful that people still like it and remember it. And I have to add, I'm baffled at Pixels. But Well, my story on that was some Thursday morning, somebody pulled me into the front office, into the marketing area, which I, where I never went. It was like I crossed through the third dimension into the marketing area, and they sat me down in the room and they showed me like one segment between commercials of Hubert. You know, clearly it was done, right? And well, you're the sound guy, and then it was like, what do you think? Now. I don't think I gave them the response they wanted because they never called me back. But my, my feeling was, you know, they gave him, he, they made him like Bugs Bunny. They gave him like a Jersey voice, you know. Just, they, they gave him a voice. He talked. And, and you know, all the characters, yeah, come on, let's all go down. And, you know, it's like, I, I, it was like happy days. yeah, I wouldn't have gone there with him. I mean, to my mind, if you a had asked me before you started production, I would have made him Charlie Chaplin. He would not have talked, except gibberish, I mean his talk, and then whenever he did that, there would be subtitles, and that would be hilarious, I right? Also tell him to speak in Russian. Yeah, 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 but you wouldn't take him where they took him. They wouldn't make him into Bugs Bunny, which is kind of what they did. Um, they didn't want to hear that, and so they kind of nodded and sent me on my way and never asked me I to mean, come back. I didn't even, you know, I, and they never gave me any of that good stuff from all, you know, they licensed that thing to what, 50, 60 things? Of like 130, I think. 130 things, yeah, and, and I never got any of that good stuff either. I should have been nicer. Columbia, Columbia Pictures took over the licensing. My only other licensing story is a very fond one that uh, Parker Brothers bought the rights to Gottlieb Games to port them, so they ported Reactor to the 2600 courageously, right? And that Christmas, Parker Brothers ran primetime ads for Reactor, and they used the music from the game. Hmm. Now. I had been a professional musician since I'd been in high school. I'd struggled on the road. I had been trying, you know, to break through the barrier and have some commercial success for, you know, years and years and years. And I've been at this game company for now like a year. My music's on TV. <laughs> it was like, yeah. And so that was a great moment. And that, that's one of my happier times is that Christmas when I could hear reactor music, stuff that I'd written being played back on that insanely minimal system on television. Is there another session question starting here? Yeah, they what? got a set of pinball machines. Oh, okay. Qu question over here? I don't know about that. <laughs> I can... Yes, I, I <laughs> continued freelancing for a number of years, um, doing some arcade games, did a few with Warren, some for Howie. Uh, some got made, some didn't, did a few cartridges. Um, I eventually got out of the business and uh, started working, uh, rehabbing. 
uh, making cabinets and doing carpentry work. And it's been about the last five years I've found out, I got introduced to this world again, that this retro gaming scene, which I didn't imagine existed at all. But that's a great segue to plug your book. Right, right. So I've been creating art, and uh, I've stayed in touch with a lot of my colleagues over the years. And uh, I was contacted by a guy named Terry Minnick, who owns the uh, Pixel Blast Arcade. And uh, I've done some projects uh, with the Gallop and Ghost Arcade. Uh, they've been very generous and supportive, and so I have this this memoir. It's a history of the uh, the Godly video game experience. Um, brand new, brand new, and uh, hopefully work on some new game projects coming up. So, uh, yes, if I can find my table. So. Two hundred and eighty-six pages. Yes. Lots of pages. Yeah, a lot of pages. A lot of a lot of pictures. Fifty pages of illustrations. Um, yeah. Well, it's out there. Um, so it, it basically, it lived in my house. Uh, my, I had a Cubert cabinet at home, and I swapped out the ROMs for faster, harder, more challenging Cubert. It was never released at the time, because it, it was kind of too early when I when I did it. I did it literally like two months after Cubert, <laughs> uh, and it it just never got released. And then um, stayed in my cabinet for 15 years. And in 1997, I want to say, I was working for Disney, and the, uh, I was made aware of MAME. A uh, guy that worked with me at Disney, Fred Susukian, uh, said, hey, I can put you in touch with those MAME guys, because uh, it's literally just a ROM swap, the exact same hardware. So I gave them ROM images for faster, harder, more challenging Cubert, and since 1980, no, 1997, it's been available. Y well. You, you can ask Howie later, but uh, my take is that... No, it I just, think it, Howie's gone by then. But it, it wasn't... Yeah. That's true. It, it wasn't ready. Uh, it was too soon. People were still discovering Qbert. My thought was they'd keep it on a shelf for a year and then release it, and why they did not, I have no idea. Any other questions? Oh, you. Uh, what gave you the idea to make Qbert's Cubes? Um, I did not have the idea to make Qbert's Cubes. Cubert's Cubes was actually made by a guy named Neil Bernstein. Uh, when Cubert was done and faster, harder, more challenging Cubert was done, um, the company said, hey, would you like to make another Cubert game? And I declined because, you know, Cubert was basically my first game. And I had other ideas I wanted to pursue. I didn't want to be locked into Cubert, even if it was popular. Uh, maybe that was unwise. I don't really regret it. Uh, I went on to work on Us Versus Them, which is probably the game I am most proud of, even though that didn't get a wide release either, but that's a whole other story. Someday maybe we'll do a thing about Us Versus Them here. Um, but Neil Bernstein came to me at one point, and he was a junior programmer. He was a younger guy, came in after, uh, or came in as the department was being built up, uh, and said, listen, I have an idea for a Kubert game. Do you mind if I you know, pursue it? And I said, no, please, go ahead. So it was all... Um, Neil, Jeff did uh, graphics, and uh, Dave unwittingly supplied the sounds because he was already did not get paid again. He was already gone from the company, but they were the same Cubert sounds. Uh, do we have to go, or this gentleman has a question? All right, I'm going to tell you something that I'm not proud of. There are only five levels in Qbert. Six, seven, eight, and nine are all the same as five. Okay? <laughs> you happy now? You made me you made me admit it. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And the only reason it goes up to nine is because it's a single digit and there was no room in the artwork to put ten. So it really it just it, 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 the, the tuning of it literally cycles after level five. It's the same level over and over again. Like Life in Caves? Yeah. Uh, Listen, it was my first game. I didn't know much about tuning. I was happy to get something out the door. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you guys yes, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.